Hi, thank you very much for having me. I particularly thank Nick for the invitation. You have to excuse me, I'm a bit um, rusty, so I'm going to flap a fair bit, probably. That is just par for the course. Um, as, a, as a student of the Battle of Pozier, Hamel is a dream to talk about. It's my favourite. Um, and so I'm really glad that Ellie um, brought up quite a few of the problems that were experienced during battle, because I tend to talk about artillery plans as though they were perfect from start to finish and everything worked, which obviously it never does. So there's two things we know about the Battle of Hamel. One is that it was the first time Australians and Americans fought together on the Western Front. And the other one is it was scheduled to take 90 minutes and it took 93, which we all heard about a lot last week, the other week. The man who orchestrated the battle, Lieutenant General Sir John Monash, said, that, said from the outset that the operation at Hamel will primarily be a tank operation. It's been thought about and talked about and studied as an infantry battle with tanks since the 93 minutes was over. But the British offensive method of 1918 was heavily dependent on a systematic application of firepower beyond this in order to support advancing infantry. And that weapon system always began with the heaviest firepower available, which is the artillery. Am I really loud? OK, because it's really loud back here. This is the map I'm going to get you to get used to. I have a heavily marked up match map early and then not much after. So this magical 90 minutes at Hamel is in fact heavily um, predicated on the artillery barrage. And it has caused me pain this week because for a very long time I could only find 86 minutes. But I found the four this morning. So just to get you familiar with this map, we've got Hamel Village here, Pear Trench, Verewood, Acroshwood, and our infantry dispositions are the 11th Brigade, 4th Brigade in the middle, and the 6th Brigade there. Um, we've got the jumping off positions for the infantry. And this is the final objective. So the infantry attack began at 10 past 3 in the morning. And at that time, the infantry began with a barrage on this line here, which you can see in relation to the infantry jumping off position. It's about uh, 200 yards in front of where they began their operation, and it lasts for four minutes, which is the four minutes I missed. Um, after that, the barrage moves across this ground, um, lifting, it, oh, it takes half an hour. So the rate of movement is 100 yards every three minutes until it reaches this line here. This is the halt line, and everything pauses for a little moment. At this point, a thick smoke screen was to be built up to protect the infantry. Um, each assaulting company more or less moves straight ahead from where they are, with their tanks and everything, up to this point, and then they begin consolidation while a second group of infantry leapfrog through and head on to the final objective. So after 10 minutes of a standing barrage on this line, it moved away a little bit more slowly. So it crosses this ground, in four lifts of 100 yards, yards each, one every four minutes. And then the artillery moved beyond the final objective line for a following 30 minutes to protect the, the work of consolidation. So by my calculations, that makes 90 minutes. I did lots of adding up <laughs> because I felt like it should be easier to find, and it's really hard to find. I don't know where the 93 minutes comes in. I have not yet found a battalion that reports coming in three minutes after, late. That's um, a monashism. So this is a heavy barrage. 16 brigades of field and horse artillery took part in firing it. And they're organised into four groups with each brigade working under its own commander as a subgroup in a fairly straightforward arrangement that goes on to be used in the future. Artillery preparation for most of these brigades was really quick, with 49 of the 61 batteries having to move into position and be in place in the four nights before the operation. They were issued with um, what was called the usual daily expenditure in harassing and observed fire, plus an additional, additional 600 rounds per gun and 500 rounds per howitzer for the barrage. So that's 132,000 rounds for 90 minute battle. With the exception of the left group of artillery, which is not behind, directly behind the infantry attack up to the north here, um, the 18 and 13 pounder guns were given around 23 yards of the start line each. So that's a really tight distribution of um, artillery. Uh, it extends to about 30 yards with that little bend in the final objective, but they are very densely packed. Um, well, their, their position is very densely packed. In 
In the, um, in the initial barrage, the 43rd Battalion, for reasons best known to themselves, was counting rounds, and they counted four rounds per gun per minute. Um, so 16 rounds in, in four minutes, every 20 odd metres of trench, basically. So beyond the barrage, oh, the barrage was reported to have worked exceptionally well. Its beginning was reported to be, and I quote, well synchronised, distributed and consistent all along the artillery start line, which are fabulous <coughs> words after 1916. And although the planned smoke barrages interfered with vision, it was believed that for the most part, shell bursts were regular and fairly consistent along the line. So they went and checked their shell patterns afterwards and felt like they were regular and, and firing as they should more or less most of the time. Beyond the barrage accompanying infantry into battle, 161 guns from various heavy artillery brigades, um, still further to the rear, engaged in counter battery work and harassing fire. And this was devastatingly accurate. Um, the Germans were almost completely incapable of directing any counter battery fire against this attack. There is um, reportedly a small amount of fire harassing the tanks operating up here in these squares, it's P10 and P11. Um, and it's coming from this direction, I think, from what I can work out, a little bit beyond Sailly Lorette, but that appears to be pretty much all of it. So um, with the, the aircraft too can um, contribute to a little bit of counter battery work and particularly in this harassing fire, dropping stuff behind the lines to try and disrupt reinforcements and the horse lines and things. A slick operation like Hamel, um, is really only possible through the constant development of artillery, which had been going on since the war began. I mean, we, I'm sure many of you know here that um, the expectation at the beginning of the war was for the artillery to wheel in line with the infantry and fire at things they could see, um, which resulted in guns being taken out pretty much immediately and everyone being withdrawn behind hills. So you're trying to hit enemy artillery behind a hill and your artillery is behind another hill they've got to work out what to see um, how, and how to hit it. It's, that's a massive shift. Um, early artillery activity was also very seriously hampered by poor quality ammunition. Um, I've read reports of shells differing in, in length by inches and being put into the same gun with the same calibration to fire at the same targets. They'd, it's just crazy. Um, calibration and wear difficulties of the gun also were very little understood in the early years of the war. So they didn't realise, you know, most, especially in the British, most of their artillery use for a long time had been naval guns, which were ceremonially fired once or twice a year. So there was no chance to watch wear on a gun, which you then fire four times a minute for 90 minutes. Um, barrels wear out, it affects the flight of shell, it causes ongoing problems. Um, and also causes barrels to blow up and all of these sorts of things are going on and there are um, very educated men desperately striving for a, to, for a solution for most of the war. A good deal of work had gone into munitions manufacture in Britain to ensure that shells were of a consistent weight and size. They're coming in batch numbers by 1918 and they are more or less guaranteed to be exactly the same weight as each other. They have complicated tables on how to weigh your fuses, which fuse to use with which shell and how that will affect the weight of your shell and how that will affect your um, mathematical calculations about the firing of your gun. Um, my supervisor of my PhD, said that, uh, Robin Pryor, said that the um, war was won by men hunched over trig tables behind the guns and that's very true. This, the maths that went on at short notice was insane and I don't understand it even a little bit. One of the um, things that these, these artillery developments have been going on, they have learned about barrel wear, they've learned about consistent munition sizes, they've learned to calibrate guns using electric screens so that you don't need to remove your guns, you can calibrate, you can register on targets, you know where they're gonna go, you know what your calibration of your gun is. Um, they have um, dramatically decreased the rates of duds of premature explo ex prematurely exploding shells. Um, the Battle of Combray in late November 1917 is a really important one for understanding a lot of these tactical developments. It's um, 
the, one of the first times they use tanks up under the barrage, but also it's one of it's the first time that they use um, they begin their artillery program without firing registration shots. So patterns Germans get very good at reading patterns of fire, and it's easy to tell when people are practicing a creeping barrage and when they're registering for an attack because things become very deliberate, rates of fire become very deliberate. And so they're good at reading it and they know what's going on. Cambrai begins with no registration shots and that is um, an, in such, an, that's such an enormous thing. The fact that they couldn't hit something they couldn't see two and a half years earlier and now they can hit something they haven't even practiced hitting is amazing. Um, and the success here um, is, it leads into what happens at Hamel as well. The, the war, Hamel doesn't suddenly appear as this perfect battle. It, it comes from a huge period of development and it, and it shifts into its place in a continued period of development. This lovely 90 minute bubble of battle that we talk about is obviously an infantry based assessment of the operation. The artillery had been at work along the Hamel front for weeks already, um, bombarding German positions, keeping them um, on their toes, and importantly, firing these habitua hip habituating barrages that Ellie talked about. So getting Germans used to expecting gas and smoke together so that they have their um, respirators on when, when, the fire, when the attack goes ahead. Um, they also get them to ignore potential creeping barrages by firing attack programs with nothing to follow. Um, getting them as unprepared as possible and on their toes as possible. Um, now, and of course, eight minutes before the battle began, the artillery was hard at work firing along the front line to mask the noise of tanks moving forward along with the, the aircraft that were flying up and down the valley. Um, so it should be 98 minutes at least. Um, the artillery, after the battle had ended, the artillery continued its counter-battery work, um, continued to harass Germans, resisted, um, centres of German resistance and potential massing infantry all along the line, and continued to work to protect these gains. The artillery at Hamel provided this overarching firepower network for the battle in, in every respect. It came before, it came after, it dictated timing and movement. By 1918, the artillery was just, it was everything that the battle had to, everything predicated on what the artillery was doing. You can't overstate its importance, which sounds like I'm sucking up to the firepower group. It's just the truth. Um, but also, by 1918, the artillery was really thoroughly removed from the infantry. In 1916, they were still trying to communicate between the frontline attacking troops and the infantry to call in SOS fire. If you see a German counterattack massing, then you send up a complicated series of flares, hope that your message gets back, hope that the artillery comes to your rescue, which they often did about 90 minutes to four hours later at Pozier. So it's not particularly effective. So once this artillery program goes ahead, nothing stops it and the infantry are more or less completely disconnected from one part of the attack. The infantryman, of course, was heavily armed himself with um, every man except stretcher bearers and Lewis gunners carrying a rifle and a bayonet, at least 100 if not 200 rounds of small arms ammunition. And your platoon would be expected to have a bombing section with... Um, with extra, like each man had two bombs and then the bombing section had another five or six and a phosphorus bomb for um, mopping up and clearing out strong points. Um, and there was also a Lewis gun, at least one Lewis gun section with you, very close by. Uh, which, can, again, I keep coming back to 1916, but it is just chalk and cheese. Compared to 1916, infantrymen said it's sent in at Pozier. The Australian infantry, as a little group of men in this mechanised battlefield, fairly bristle with firepower on an individual level. And the infantry also bristles with firepower on a corporate level. So um, between the artillery and the infantry in the field, you have machine guns, the Vickers machine guns, which sometimes um, are deployed add, to add to the barrage and sometimes are deployed to enter the field of battle with the infantry. Um, and you, but because they don't fire the barrage from as far back as the um, artillery, they're at closer to hand and they're more likely to come to the rescue with any SOS fire that's required. Um, 
and also there's trench mortars. Again, at Hamel, a small number go forward with the infantry, a small number are, exist in this mid area ahead of the artillery behind the infantry attack, just in case. It's, at Hemel, it's not particularly effective having this layer um, because everything is so smoky and dusty. As soon as everything kicks off, nobody knows what's going on. But it is a just-in-case that adds to the firepower of the infantry. Um, and of course, this is the point where we must discuss the role of the tank at Hamel. You've seen an, a variety of this already. But I, while hopes had been held for the tank to eventually replace the cavalry as, an ep, as a weapon of exploitation, in the meantime, there'd been this tendency to use them to replace the artillery, which Monash wanted to do, um, especially to replace the creeping barrage. Counter-battery works always a little bit separate. Um, and this had failed so dismally in the past, and notably at Bulacor, um, that this is where the problem with tanks really lies. But at Combray, they had pushed them forward under the barrage and used them with the infantry as close as they thought was possible. Um, and this tactic at Hamel was amplified a great deal. After consultation, which is, you know, the real genius of Monash is that he went and consulted with as many different people as he could. And after, this, after his consultation with Courage, with Sinclair McLagan and other people, um, they actually pushed the tanks up much further forward under the barrage than was previously thought possible. And so the infantry immediately have access to a heavy, heavy source of firepower to deal with the problems of German machine guns that haven't been silenced by the barrage and strong points that they're having trouble reducing. Um, it's a very, very complicated method for the um, infantry to signal to tanks. They walked up to it and donged on the side or they waved a flag and the infantry came and ran over whatever they needed. And it, it works, it's not sophisticated at all, but it works very well, um, particularly on the outskirts of Hamel village and at Verewood, um, the Germans have strong posts, strong posts which um, were overcome through this dual action of tanks and infantry with a minimum of casualties. The tanks sort of became this major bridge between the heavy but remote firepower of the artillery and this vulnerable infantryman you have to get forward to occupy the ground to win the battle. But in reality, this is not a tank and infantry to show. Artillery preparation for particip and participation in this operation stretched from a time when Hamel was just a twinkle in Monash's eye to long after it had finished. Tens of thousands of rounds were fired in support of the attack from hundreds of guns. This was as much firepower as one corps could reasonably expect to be expected to pull in for a limited objective attack and then some. It was a thoroughly thought out and well executed plan that received the success it deserved. Thank you.